thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be here, but especially so this year because we had a brutal spring in Boston. And this is joint work with um, Ricardo Caballero. Now, the motivation for this paper um, comes from a you know, growing finance literature that argues that prices of risky assets, such as stocks or houses, fluctuate without necessarily visible changes in fundamentals, such as earnings or dividends for stocks or rents for houses. And the literature has given it a name. They call it the time varying risk premium, although they also debate whether this is truly driven by risk considerations or irrational uh, beliefs or sentiment. Now, relatedly, there is also a, an emerging macro, empirical macro literature that argues that um, these asset price fluctuations matter for the, for the business cycle. For instance, the low prices during the risk off phase might exacerbate recessions. There's influential work, work by Mian and Sufi uh, in which they argue that the house price collapse in the US explains much of the job losses during the Great Recession. Now, by the same token, um, the high prices in the risk on phase, people think might be associated with some excesses such as speculation, which might then exacerbate the recession once we switch into the risk off or low asset prices. So central banks, central bankers around the world seem to be acutely aware of these connections between financial markets and, and business cycles. Um, so uh, you're gonna, many of you will remember Alan Greenspan and his fascination with stock prices, his famous speech on irrational exuberance. There is a recent paper by, very nice paper by Anna Sislak and Annette Wissing Jorgensen in which they show that this fascination with stock prices actually goes beyond Greenspan. So they analyze the, uh, they do a textual analysis of FOMC minutes and transcripts and they show that the mentions of stock price declines in the minutes, for instance, uh, predicts target rate uh, cuts, interest rate cuts, even after controlling for a lot of other things that you might think might influence the central banker decisions. And the central bankers are actually in those minutes and transcripts, if you read more carefully, they're quite transparent about why they care about um, uh, risky asset prices. They worry about, for instance, a wealth effect on consumption. If the stock prices collapse, that, that might reduce consumption through a wealth effect. And they also worry about potentially adverse effects on investment. And there is already a risk-centric, if you want, macro literature that analyzes these connections between risky asset prices and macro outcomes. And many of you uh, have written in that literature. But that literature typically emphasizes financial frictions um, as being the reason. So high asset prices matter because they relax financial frictions and low asset prices conversely matter because they tighten them. And they don't concern so much with a few exceptions with monetary policy or demand issues. The effects kind of create damage through the supply side, right? Capital gets misallocated to low productivity agents or our investment goes down and our productive capacity goes down. Um, what we are going to do in this paper is we're going to offer a complementary model or risk-centric model where in which we're going to take off financial frictions off the table not because we don't believe in them, but we want to isolate some other mechanisms. Instead, we're going to focus on what we call interest rate frictions. Basically, the combination of nominal rigidities and constraints on monetary policy in interest rate setting, which generates interest rate frictions, in, in real interest rate frictions, and ultimately make aggregate demand relevant for economic activity. And all of our mechanisms will work through aggregate demand, okay? So, but if you bring financial frictions into our setup, in fact, many of the mechanisms, mechanisms would become even stronger. Oh, yes. Real rate will not adjust, exactly. It would be different because then there will be other adjustments like exports and imports. So it's important that in fact, you have a real interest rate rigidity. Okay, so, um, so, um, but if a small open economy with fixed exchange rate would be similar. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in fact, that's, that's what I'm gonna come back to that later, okay? So, okay, so basically, to summarize the results, so the, we're going to look at an episode with the, the risk premium is gonna go up and that will push down asset prices, push downward pressure on, pressure on risky asset prices. And we're gonna have in our model connections between asset price and aggregate demand naturally. So through wealth effect and through, for instance, Q theory type relation. So uh, if the monetary policy does not push back against this, 
these downward pressure in asset prices would translate into low aggregate demand and recession. So when the monetary policy is unconstrained, therefore, monetary policy will want to cut rates when there are shocks like this, and will want to push back asset prices and counter stabilize the FX. But when the monetary policy is constrained, for instance, due to the zero lower bound, or due to a currency union or fixed exchange rates, then in fact, we're going to have a demand recession triggered by risk shocks in financial markets. Okay, so, and once we are in the recession, there will be feedback effects because when the economy slows down, earnings and dividends of firms will, will go down and that will actually lower prices further and will create room for spirals between aggregate demand and asset prices. And I'm going to in fact show you uh, some empirical evidence that these mechanisms uh, might have been relevant. Um, uh, uh, our strategy will be to compare the effect of house price shocks within the Eurozone where monetary policy of individual countries are restricted versus outside the Eurozone where countries have um, uh, their own monetary policy. Okay, so, and here's the sort of, and this, these results were, are largely about the recession phase or the, the risk off phase, low price phase of the cycle. Now rolling back to the risk, the high price phase of the cycle, the boom phase, you know, I'm gonna also analyze the effect of disagreements which we broadly think of as capturing heterogeneous valuations. We're going to have optimists and pessimists, but really what we have in mind is like some agents that can value assets more highly than others. You can also think of it as financial institutions that uh, value risky assets higher than others. And we're going to, I'm going to show you that in this environment with disagreements during the boom phase, there's going to be speculation. So there's going to be trade between high and low valuation agents. For instance, optimists will take on more risk than, than pessimists. And I'm going to show you that actually speculation will exacerbate the recession once we transition into the low price phase of the cycle. And that will motivate macro prudential policy during the boom phase to push back against speculation. Okay, so they're going to be, in fact, they're going to be aggregate demand externalities and the macro prudential policy will be useful, will generate a Pareto improvement by internalizing uh, these uh, externalities. Okay, so, so our main uh, model is going to be set in continuous time. But I'm going to first show you a two-period version to illustrate the basic uh, mechanisms. And it will also be a stepping stone into the, uh, the dynamic uh, model. OK, so, so sorry, yeah. just to clarify, basically what you're saying is that even without financial frictions, if I have a shock to the value of assets, this will have a wealth effect, therefore an aggregate demand effect. Exactly. And if that cannot be accommodated, well, all of this. Exactly. Effects. That's exactly your, yeah. That's ex now we are going to formalize that, but you've already sort of, you know, I mean, predicted the result. Uh, you mean exactly so this, this kind of shocks that we have in mind are going to be things actually that don't affect the Productive sure. capacity economy, but that will be could be a beliefs about the future It could be a risk it could be risk aversion In fact, I'm going to show you all of these shocks will play very similarly from a macroeconomic uh, Point of view. Okay, so what we need is a price uh, downward pressure on asset prices without any effect on the supply determined uh, level of output Okay, so so the two period model there's going to be capital and it's going to be fixed. There's no depreciation. There's no investment. The productivity of the capital is noted by Z and um, normalize it to one in the initial period. In the second period, there's going to be a, a risk. So there's aggregate risk because the risk premium that it generates is going to be important for analysis. So Z1, the productivity in the second period is uncertain and it has an expected growth, G, and it has a volatility denoted by uh, sigma. And the actual output in this economy can, below, can be below the pro, uh, productivity level due to uh, you know, so the, the, the demand frictions. So for simplicity, I'm going to assume at date one, in fact, output is at capacity. So we're going to focus on the endogenous determination of output in, in date zero, in period zero. Okay, so, and there's going to be a, a Lucas tree or a market portfolio, which is essentially claim to all outputs uh, in period one. And, and so its payoff is given by Z1. And uh, it will have an endogenous price denoted by uh, Q. So on the demand side, there's going to be these consumer investors that will make consumption savings decisions. But importantly, they will also make a portfolio allocation decision. Once they decide how much to save, they'll also decide whether to put their money into the market portfolio or the risk-free asset. In equilibrium, of course, everything in this representative household setting will be put into the market portfolio. But the portfolio allocation decision <coughs> will determine the price of the market portfolio or expected return. And uh, the consumers uh, will have Epstein's in preferences relatively standard. We're going to normalize the intertemporal, we're going to take the intertemporal substitution to be equal to one for simplicity. 
And in the, in the two-period model, um, we, are gonna, we can be general about the risk aversion. In the dynamic model, in fact, I'm going to set that to one as well. So we're going to have log utility, okay, which will simplify things quite a bit. And on the supply side, there's going to be these new Keynesian firms. Uh, basically, they set their prices in the past, and they're happy to service whatever demand that comes to door, door now. So that means that output is going to be determined by demand. And in this model, there is no investment. So Demand just comes from consumption, so output is equal to consumption, up to the capacity constraint. Okay, so, and there is monetary policy, and the monetary policy here is trying to do the right thing. The prices are rigid, but the monetary policy, by changing the nominal rate, can determine the real interest rate. And it's trying to set the real interest rate, essentially to replicate the supply determined output level, because that's an efficient thing to do. But it might be unable to do so due to some constraint. And in our model, we're going to focus on the zero lower bound constraint, but in fact, the effects apply regardless of what the constraint is. Okay, so now this is the model basically. And if you start to solve this model, the first thing that you notice is that there is a tight relationship between asset prices and output. Why? Well, it comes basically through the wealth effect, right? We have essentially EIS equals one, or essentially think log utility, which means that consumers consume a fraction of their lifetime wealth. So that creates a connection between asset prices and consumption. And consum once you set consumption equal to output, you can solve this and you can find a connection between asset prices and output. And the intuition is straightforward. If asset prices are higher, people will consume more and that will increase demand and output. Okay, so of course, asset prices need to be consistent also with equilibrium in risk markets. And that comes from the portfolio choice of the households. And this is how the portfolio choice looks like in equilibrium. So on the left-hand side, uh, you have basically the amount of risk that the economy generates. On the right-hand side, you have the reward that you need to give in equilibrium to the households to hold, to, to hold this risk, right? So, and the reward um, depends on basically the Sharpe ratio, which is the expected return on capital, right? The payoff of capital minus its price. This is the expected return on capital minus the risk-free rate. This is the risk premium normalized by risk. This is how much return you get per risk, right? So it turns out that people will be happy to hold the market portfolio if and only if they get compensated in the form of a high enough risk premium, right? Okay, so, uh, so those are the equations that determine the equilibrium, and we need the monetary policy to, to close the model. Now, if you wanna have full employment in this economy, or full supply determined output, you can. You just need to set the asset prices high enough that the implied wealth effect is strong enough that people consume enough to clear the goods market, right? There's a level of Q that will give you the supply determined output, output level, Q star, let's call it Q star, right? If you plug it into the risk balance condition, you can solve for the R star that you need to bring about that high, high enough level of asset price, right? And the idea is that monetary policy needs to lower the interest rates enough to support high enough asset prices to clear the goods market, right? And if you look at the resulting formula for the interest rate, you see that it's actually very similar to what you see in like macro or finance textbooks, typically motivated by something like precautionary savings. But we give it a slightly different interpretation, right? For instance, starting from the supply determined equilibrium, suppose there is a shock to risk aversion or risk, okay? So let's take risk, but risk aversion is very similar. If risk goes up, what happens? Well, temporarily, this equation is violated, right? The economy generates too much risk relative to what people are willing to absorb. Something needs to happen. And the natural or the frictionless response of the economy is a decline in the risk-free rate. By cutting the risk-free rate, monetary policy is giving the people the premium that they desire without a need for asset prices to collapse. And that keeps asset prices relatively high. That keeps aggregate demand relatively high and output equal to supply, right? But you see where I'm going, just one second. You see where I'm going with this. If monetary policy is constrained, the only thing that can adjust here is asset prices, right? Now a risk shock will translate into a reduction in Q and people still will get the premium that they desire because when asset prices are low enough, at some point they expect the return is going to be high enough, so they will hold. But uh, uh, they, they will hold the market portfolio. But the, the adjustment through asset prices is bad adjustment because the wealth effect that it implies will generate will, will trigger a demand recession. Okay, so now I can take the, the questions. Yeah. 
So yeah, well, it depends on it depends on how you like. Okay, for instance, if, even if the a small open economy, you can have adjustment through exports and imports, and you know, I, I need to see the details of the model for that. But but you know, I guess like you have nominal rigidities. Yeah. Homogeneous tradable goods. Okay. Do you think so, so okay, so by the way, once you trade upward sloping, okay, suppose I have like a uh, labor supply is fixed, which is the kind of benchmark. I don't want to have, a, I don't want to have like a real business cycle type. So then in fact, you can see even in a closed open economy, people will produce, it's just the prices will have to adjust one way or another. Yeah. Okay, but that's not what we are interested in. We are interested in nominal rigidities and demand recessions. Okay, yes. Yeah. It could be similar. It could be similar. Okay, okay so, yeah. Monetary policy, I see the monetary policy restricts first deposit nominal rates, how it affects future deposit rates. Yeah. But monetary policy is playing a role? Oh, nominal rigidities play a role in creating the sort of, sort of nominal rigidities uh, ensure that real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate and it's determined by monetary policy, right? If you don't have nominal uh, rigidity, like fully flexible, monetary policy can do weird things, but still prices can adjust to generate the real rate. But what we see in the real world is inflation and prices are quite sticky. So in fact, there's a very close uh, correlation, especially in the advanced economies between nominal and real rate, right? So that's what the nominal rigidities are really doing for you, that uh, real rate, yes. G is the growth rate of uh, productivity here. So the, br the growth rate of Z, right? Initially it's one, and. If you shut down the fact that we are going to produce less and get zero? Oh, so that's a great question. So it, yes, it, it does, well, it, it, so it, 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 it does, but it doesn't yeah. come into well, the it's equation. One over Z zero, so. It's at one over Z zero, exactly. So and that turns out to be the relevant, uh, you know. So why is not the adjustment there? Why is not that, the. That helps you mean Z1? Uh, no, this is Z1 over Z0 or Z1 over? This is Z1 capacity over Z0. This not is capacity utilization. Not capacity utilization, exactly. So and is this a right one that comes from the reference? Yes, that's, what, that's the thing that comes. That's a good question, but that's the thing that comes from the equation. But what's going to happen, I think maybe you want, so you, one thing that's going to happen when you go to the dynamic model is G is going to be endogenous because of Z1, because there's going to be a recession in the future as well. And you know, and the, 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 the firm's earnings are, are going to go down. So, so here, actually, Z0 doesn't matter. Okay, I know an answer to your question. Because capital, this is the Q is the price of capital at the end of the period. So you don't care about Z0. All that matters is the, uh, you know, Z1. So this is the expectation of Z1, right, if you want. And once we normalize Z0 to 0, does it, does it, does it answer your question? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so When consumption falls, well, yes, people desire to save, but uh, in equilibrium, that doesn't, you know, so what happens is that output falls and desired saving ends up becoming, going back to zero here. In this, in this model, there's no saving, right? there's no investment. So people desire to save, but, you know, ultimately, the consumption is the, or aggregate demand for goods that determines the output. And of course, savings equal investment is re eventually established, but it's established through a, a recession, right? Recession creates, uh, ends up reducing your actual savings and you clear the uh, asset market. Really? So. Okay, but the other thing I should note here is that, well, once you're in the recession, further effects on, you know, risk shocks will directly affect economic activity, right? The further risk shock, because monetary policy cannot push back against them. The other thing is that, like, the finance literature is arguing whether asset prices are fluctuating due to risk or some beliefs. In our framework, it doesn't really matter, right? They, they play out very similarly. So if like prices are low because people are irrationally pessimistic, that basically has a very similar effect, right? The mechanism is very similar. From a macro point of view, uh, it doesn't matter. Of course, it will be important to understand in practice which one is more important. Okay, so, so let, before I go to the dynamic model, let me also illustrate, use, use this two-period model to illustrate why belief disagreements or more, more broadly heterogeneous valuations matter. So, sorry. So now consider the same two period model, but with two types of agents, optimists and pessimists. They disagree on G. So optimists think the uh, 
productivity growth is going to be, output growth is going to be higher, and uh, pessimist thing is going to be lower, and their initial wealth share are exogenous and given by alpha, okay? So they hold alpha of the capital and alpha of the initial output. Now in this case, you can just follow similar steps and show that basically the equilibrium in the constraint case looks like this. It's very similar to before, except when you calculate G, which actually is expected, expected productivity, you do a weighted average of the different agents, and, and you see it. Uh, if there are more optimists during the, the low price phase, that's good for the economy, right? If alpha is bigger, optimism is greater during the low price phase, that's going to support asset prices, that's going to support uh, spending and, and economic activity. But of course, in a dynamic setting, alpha is going to be endogenous because these optimists and pessimists will speculate with one another. And I'm going to argue, show you later, that in fact that speculation will work in the opposite direction that you want it to work, okay? So it will end up... Um, reducing optimist wealth during recessions precisely when you need optimists, uh, and that's why uh, speculation will make things worse, and that's why macroprudential policy uh, will be useful. Okay so, okay, so let me get to the dynamic model. So the dynamic model is similar to the two pyramids. It's uh, uh, still a, it's an AK model, um, but um, with, uh, with, um, with aggregate uncertainty. And so it is, uh, we, so there are two differences. It's in continuous time. So it's similar to Bruno Armaier Sanikov, if you, if you know that, that paper, at least in terms of the basic structure of the economy. So there are these Brownian shocks, which capture shocks to the productivity of the economy. And we put those shocks to K, just because it's simpler to analyze, but it, things will be very similar if we put the shocks to A, okay? So you, can, you should really think of it as productivity shocks. And the, there are two differences from Bruno Armaier Sanikov. Or, uh, the, the, so there's one, so one important difference from Bruno Armaier Sanikov that's about this subscript S, okay? So, so uh, we assume that the volatility, the sort of the risk, the risk in the economy uh, is time varying. So in particular, there are two risk states. There is a high risk state and there is a low risk state. And the economy transition between these two states according to a mark, uh, Poisson processes, okay? So you sort of spend some time in the low risk state and there's a risk shock that pushes you into the high risk state. You spend some time there and then you go back and so on and so forth, okay? So, and lambda S captures uh, the transition probabilities, the jump probability into the other state when you are in state S, okay? So, and uh, for now, it's gonna be a representative household setting where everyone agrees on lambda S. Later, when I introduce disagreements, that's gonna be about lambda S, okay? So optimists and pessimists will disagree on how long these risk states will gonna, will gonna go, are gonna go on, and optimists will be optimistic in the way that you, you would think. The other thing I should note here is, um, now there is investment in this model, so there is growth and there's endogenous growth, and so that's going to be one difference uh, from the two period model, which will enable us to show some additional uh, additional effects. So we assume a particular functional form for production production function of capital. That's not so important. The qualitative effects will be similar, but as we will see, this fu functional form which we take from Bruno Marasenko will, will will make things uh, quite simple. Uh, and and the final thing I want to note is that it's a dynamic setting, but we assume just like in a two-period model, there is enough assets that the market uh, is complete, okay? So the market is going to be dynamically complete. Um, there's going to be this market portfolio as before, but there is also going to be out of Deborah securities that will enable uh, people to trade uh, uh, on, that, on that transition uh, risk, okay? So the markets are going to be, in the, in the representative household case, it's not going to matter very much, but it's going to be important when we introduce uh, disagreements. Now, otherwise, the model is very similar to the two-period model. There is investors with actually even simpler preferences, log utility, and output is demand determined. Right now, demand comes from consumption and investment, but the sum of the two will determine output, and the, the factor utilization is going to be endogenous. Up to, up to one, okay, denoted by eta. And the monetary policy will try to actually set eta equals to one or replicate the supply determined level, but again, it's subject to um, a constraint on the interest rate, okay, the lower bound constraint. Now, um, in the dynamic model, we still have the output asset price relation that I showed you before. Now we have it actually for two reasons, right? We still have the wealth effect on consumption. If you look at consumption, you see that people, because of log utility, want to consume a fraction of aggregate wealth. But now we also have a Q theory type relation. Investment and asset prices are related as well, right? When asset prices are higher, uh, it's more valuable. Capital is more valuable, and so firms will invest more. When asset prices are lower, firms will invest less. That functional form 
is just making this equation linear, otherwise not playing an important role. And when you put the two things together, you see aggregate demand depends on asset prices. And as before, there's going to be a level of asset prices or price of capital that will bring back the supply determined output level. Anything below that price will give you a demand recession. Now here's the sort of one thing that's different from the two period model. Now in fact, we also have a growth asset price relationship, right? Because when you're in a recession and asset prices are lower, investment is going to fall as well. And this is an AK model, so growth is going to fall as well. So in the future, economic activity is going to be s slower, even if you don't have a demand problem in the future. Okay, so, yes. So essentially, you can view some of, you know, there's, a, there's another way to tell this story through precautionary savings, right? So it's like, there's, there's a representative also. You can sort of ignore asset prices. What happens when risk goes up is people have a desire, precautionary savings desire that reduce their consumption. You can see it through the Euler equation. And what we are doing here is we are telling the story in a different way. We are sort of putting the asset prices in the middle. So when risk goes up, asset prices go down and people consume less. You can think of it as a precautionary savings effect. You can think of it as a wealth effect. They're actually the same. Oh. So there is, well, there is no safe, there is not safe asset in this, and, well, there is some safe asset in practice, but the important thing is that there's aggregate risk. So of course, you know, there's a scarcity of safe asset if you want, okay? So you know, there is not enough of it. Because there's not enough of it, the desire, the precautionary desire ends up lowering asset prices so that at some point people say, okay, I want to hold safe assets, but you know, the, the interest rates are so low that I actually want to hold stocks and earn the risk premium, right? That's kind of what happens in this one. Okay. Okay, so uh, now this is the key equation of the dynamic model, which is the, similar to the risk balance condition, risk, risk market equilibrium condition I showed in the two period model. As before, uh, there is risk on the left hand side and reward on the right hand side. And now this needs to hold state by state. In each state, the amount of risk in that state should be equal to the reward. Now, but the reward is now endogenous. Why? Because the return to capital is endogenous. It goes back to Joma's question. So in particular, it turns out in the dynamic model, the dividend yields from um, capital turns out to be fixed in this stylized model. It's raw. Um, the growth is endogenous. So the, the growth of dividends is endogenous. That affects the return. So this is. And the other thing that matters is uh, transitions between states because if there is a transition from one state to another, capital will be repriced. The Q will change. And uh, that creates from an ex ante point of view, ex ante expected gains or losses, and that enters the expected return on capital as well. Okay, so, but this is kind of like a risk adjusted expected return on capital. And again, there's the, the numerator is the risk premium and it's the Sharpe ratio. Uh, okay, so. Value shocks will map in the same way as previously. Yes. But it seems like it's important to the risk of the capital in which you invest. Imagine I, I had real estate and my wealth would have declined. Now potentially I would want to increase my cost. No. So it seems well, critical that the source of the risk is, um, is the price of investment. Yeah, I mean, there needs to be, I mean, it needs to, I mean, even the real estate, if the price goes down, there's still going to be a wealth effect, but there's going to be effects on residential investment as well. So you're going to have these effects still. Am I going to, am I going yeah, to you're going to, in fact, in this model, there's only one capital, but if you thought two capitals, there would be a switch, but, you know, even if it's like a, if the one, each capital is a substantial fraction of total capital, if there's a shock to it, these effects would still be present, okay? And there will be some substitution to the other capital as well, right? Does it, but it's not going to fully undo it because you're still going to get demand effects from that other capital, which, you know, will create some damage. Get both things to decline or would you substitute? I typically would substitute to the other one, unless the risk shock is aggregate. It could be also the aggregate risk shock, okay? But if the risk shock is only to one, you're going to get some uh, substitution to the, to the other capital. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's the risk balance condition. And the other thing that you should note here is that there is no T subscript. So this is a, this is a, a so dynamic complex model, there's Brownian motions, et cetera. There's a lot of stochasticity. It, but it turns out that the price of capital, which is what, what the thing that you care about, is actually constant within each state, right? So K is moving around, but Q is constant. Why? Because of the linear structure of the environment. So really, I mean, this is the case in the representative household uh, setting. It's going, to not, it's going to be a little more complicated when we go to belief disagreements. But here, the only thing you need to solve is really the price of capital 
in the good and in the bad state. Okay, you need to solve it together with the interest rate in the good and in the bad state. And, uh, and, and we're going to focus on the set of parameters where monetary policy is going to be constrained in the high risk state, just like in the two period model. So the price of capital will have to adjust to satisfy this equation. And, but in the other state, the monetary policy is go not going to be constrained, and so R1 is going to be adjusted to satisfy this equation. So you have two equations, two risk conditions for two states, and two things to solve, right? Q2 and R1, right? So, so let's solve for Q2. So in that state, monetary policy is constrained, so we set that to zero. So we basically need to find the Q2 that satisfies this equation. And, you know, and, and, and just like in the static model, basically we are two period model, we are looking for a decline in asset prices to stabilize the risk markets. But now we are up for a surprise. Because unlike in the two period model, where the decline in Q was all, always stabilizing this risk condition, now this is no longer the case, right? Why? Because there is feedback effects that go from low prices to returns, right? So for instance, focus on the dividend yield firm. So, you know, in the two period model, the, the pay of the dividends from stocks capital was, was, was exogenous, but now it's endogenous. Because if you, go into the, if you go into the recession, economic activity slows down and firms' earnings and dividends go down. And if that was exogenous, the decline in prices would increase the dividend yield, and that would be a stabilizing force. But now we lose that stabilizing force because of that endogenous feedback from economic activity to asset firms. Now, there's a second feedback which is even worse. That comes through the growth. Sorry? What's a small Q? What is this? Small Q is log of BQ. So, okay. yeah. There's a second feedback which comes through growth because once you're in the recession, growth falls down as well. Again, that's something that lowers the returns and pushes the asset prices further downward, right? So, so you might be wondering how on earth things get equilibrated in this environment once we start falling below Q star. Well, it turns out that it's coming through that uh, second term, right? So in this environment, we're kind of hoping for it hoping that the high risk conditions will end and we're going to transition to the low risk condition and prices are going to go up. So if the Q, uh, and, and when the prices go up, we're going to make capital gains. And when the current Q is lower as it falls, those capital gains look larger and that's a stabilizing force, right? So, and so for that stabilizing force to dominate, in fact, we need the optimism. So the probability of transition back into recovery uh, to be sufficiently high for that to be an equilibrium, okay? So this is how, uh, so there's a minimum level of optimism that below which, in fact, these spirals are so strong that you get zero output and zero prices. I mean, of course, not, not necessarily realistic, but it's illustrating how strong these things can become. But uh, above that level of optimism, we're going to have a stable equilibrium. But as you see, changes in beliefs will have a great impact on output uh, prices and ultimately economic activity, not only because beliefs have a direct impact on asset prices, but also because they're going to mediate the strength of these spirals, right? When people are pessimistic and think that the high-risk conditions and the recession are going to go on for a, for a long time, they're really pessimistic about firms' earnings and dividends, and that you know, keeps asset prices and output uh, very low. Okay? So now, rolling back to uh, the low-risk state, one interesting thing here is that so low-risk state, volatility is low, risk premium, uh, exogenous shifters of the risk premium are low, kind of like current environment with low volatility. But nonetheless, in this environment, if you solve for the endogenous R1 interest rate in that state, you can find that it actually can be quite low. Why? Because people, are, people fear a transition back into the high-risk state, which, because of constrained monetary policy, will create a bit of a disaster and a recession. And that fear of disaster keeps interest rates up. Just like in a barrel kind of disaster uh, uh, setting, but here the disaster is endogenous, driven by uh, these uh, demand effects. Okay, so now, uh, now let me uh, uh, switch gears a little bit and try to show you some empirical evidence that these effects uh, are arguably relevant. And uh, let me sort of admit that this is the first time I'm presenting empirical evidence in a conference. And depending on how, it, how this goes, it might also be the last time. So uh, what, you know, what we did basically is the following. So yes. Before you go there. Yes. Can we what? Do QE. Oh, yeah. Uh, for instance, forward guidance would, would, would work here. Yeah, yes. I, I don't want to read QE, um, QE, I mean, depends on how we, I mean, in this model, um, QE wouldn't work because there are no financial frictions. I mean, it's a completely frictionless model. There's even like Ricardian equivalence and so on. But if you put some frictions, you can make QE work. But what, what you can have, even in this environment, is forward guidance is, is going to work. Okay? Yeah. So, right, so there's no way to prop up the price of the asset by 
not in this framework, but you can think of variance. In fact, we are thinking of variance of it where, you know, we want to analyze those issues in this framework. So but we are not there yet. Oh, you can sort of commit to keeping interest rates lower than the stabilizing level in good times and keep asset prices higher than Q star in good times because then you can see how forward guidance is going to work, right? Because then uh, the high prices, even higher than Q star in good times makes the expected capital gains even larger and that ends up increasing Q2 as well, okay? We in fact find that forward guidance is quite powerful in this environment, but that's very similar to the forward guidance puzzle that people have already emphasized, nothing really special. Um, to our environment. Okay, so, so the, in terms of the empirical evidence, while well, the model is uh, emphasizes the zero, zero lower bound as the constraint in the empirical analysis, we're going to work with the currency union, the eurozone, as the constraint on monetary policy for a variety of reasons that turns out to be easier to analyze empirically. There's more data and so on, but you know, we think the results would apply in the zero lower bound case as well. So what we do is we assemble a panel of uh, cross-country panel uh, we, uh, of advanced economies, and we start the panel in 1990 where uh, the developed economies largely conquered inflation because we want monetary policy to be more concerned with output stabilization and inflation stabilization. And we're going to divide this panel, so, uh, we're going to have our sam two subsamples. There's going to be the euro subsample, or also the European exchange rate mechanism, which eventually led to the euro. So these are the countries that are, you know, either in the euro or in the exchange rate mechanism. And there are the remaining countries which arguably, and these countries arguably don't have their own monetary policy, so they are the constrained countries. And these are the countries that have their own monetary policy. So our strategy will be to do a local. Do the countries that fell out of it, like Sweden and UK, the ones that were in the ERM? Yeah, so, so like UK, in fact, we could put it in the, I mean, we started in 1990, so UK was like in it for two years, so you could put it, it doesn't really change anything. So what, my, what we did was like, continuous member of ERM that eventually led to the euro. Okay, so that's the, that was our selection to put them into the ERM category. So, uh, but you can change, you can, it's not gonna change things very much. You can, yeah, uh, um, you know, we can play around with that. But okay, so our strategy is gonna be sort of a Jorda style local projection regression. So these are basically like um, uh, panel regressions where uh, we, um, use as the shock the price changes and we're going to look at house price changes controlling for a bunch of other things and we're going to look at the effect of this shock uh, at different horizons like next uh, you know quarter four quarters later eight quarters later and so on going all the way into the future so we are going to estimate the impl impulse response of the shock one at a time right it's a little different than VIRs but it's kind of more flexible you're estimating the impulse at every point and and so we're going to be interested in outcome, our outcome variables are going to be the policy interest rate and economic activity variables like output, uh, consumption, investment, because our model makes sharp predictions about those. And we're going to include as controls the recent house price changes. So if you look at house prices, there's a lot of momentum in house prices, so it's actually important to control for past changes. So the shock is really capturing the surprise element, the shock element, right? So we're going to also try to control for changes in GDP for a, as a crude control for the business cycle. And we're going to try to control for mon uh, interest rate and its changes as a crude control for monetary policy. The important thing is that we're going to run these regressions separately for the ERM and the non-ERM sample because our model makes different predictions for those. The shock, the shock is, it's okay. Yeah, so the shock is a change in uh, decline in house prices after controlling for the house prices in the last two years and a bunch of other things like GDP and so on. Okay, so a surprise decline, 1% decline in house prices, exactly. So you're thinking of the ERM as the constraint? As the constraint, the constraint exactly. But because other, you have countries that have the zero or bound in the contract. Yes, you can, you can, yeah, that's right. So although you can, you can cut the sample before 2007, so it doesn't change things very much, okay? So, but, you know, these are, these are good points. So, um, but, so we can come back to it. But let me show you what we have. And then, you know, it's robust. It's robust to sample selection and so on. That was the question. OK, so, so uh, let me, I mean, we are going to uh, exploit the full panel structure here, like put country fixed effect, time fixed effects. But let me first show you what happens without time fixed effects. So it's a bit like running now VAR sort of by pulling all the data, looking at the shock within each country. Uh, yeah, but all the, all, the, uh, all the countries are pulled together. So what you see here is, well, it really looks like a decline in house price, looks like a demand shock in the sense that 
it's uh, followed by a decline in economic activity and increase in unemployment, and it's followed by a slight decline in inflation, and monetary policy reduces the interest rate to fight that, but ECB reduces the interest rate, the red is the ERM or euro sample, so ECB reduces the interest rate less, as you would expect, because this is not a euro area shock, right? This is like a shock to Spain, or shock to one of the member countries, uh, and there's an idiosyncratic component to that, so as you would expect, the euro ECB is not completely stabilizing that. The outside ECB, uh, monetary policy reacts uh, much more uh, strongly, right? So now, in fact, that, and, and you already see, though, even in this case where ECB reacts a little bit, there is already a difference between ECB and non, you know, euro and non-euro. Now, let me show you our main specification where we also control for time fixed effects for each sample. We absorb now things that are common in the euro area, right? So this really, for instance, in the red line, the est estimates illustrated by the red line really come from comparing Spain with Germany after absorbing all the common things. The blue lines come from comparing the US that had a house price shock with uh, like Australia or Canada that didn't have as big a house price. Like, again, after absorbing for all the effects that are common uh, across these countries. And what you see is there's a sharp interest rate reaction outside the Euro area and there is not no such a thing. I mean, Spain and, and Ger Germany, they share the same monetary policy. So, you know, you don't get a interest rate reduction in Spain to counter, to offset that additional shock in Spain. So the CPI in Spain goes down, the unemployment in Spain goes up a lot, and, and economic activity <coughs> goes down a lot in Spain or in the you know, Euro area shock countries. In, in other, uh, not outside Euro area, economic activity starts to go down, but it doesn't, you know, it's eventually stabilized, and arguably it's because monetary policy reduces the rates and helps to dampen the effect, right, as in our model, yes. Yeah, I wouldn't want to rule that out because we're not, I'm not necessarily arguing against financial frictions, but the point is that even without financial frictions, you would have, uh, expect these, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you know, even without financial frictions, you would expect, I don't want to say fin financial frictions are irrelevant, so, you know, so we're just isolating a mechanism which becomes arguably even further strengthened uh, by financial frictions, okay, so. Uh, Yeah, I mean, just as an illustration, it's, the, it's like a shock in the Eurozone, one Eurozone country controlling for everything else that's happening. But the other guys are expanding, right, in response to, well, if there's a slight decline in interest rate, even if it's small, Germany would be... What do you mean, this? Oh, yeah, they are, but we are really looking at the regression, speaking up the differential effect in Spain versus Germany, okay? So this is what it's... Absolute, the severity of Spanish recession is relative to the German. Exactly, this is the relative... Well, this is the without time fixed effects. This is kind of what happens in a typical country when there's a shock, right? Yes. Yeah. One, one of the problems of what you have in mind at some level is that there has to be the Eurozone plus the chart, plus the procedural shock, you know, okay, whatever. We have one way to address that, which is to take to break the US and stick. So yes. You have two groups of countries mm -hmm. that are Yeah, we can definitely do that. In fact, that's arguably what, or it's similar to what Miana and Sufi did. They find that the areas that had bigger house price collapse had bigger declines in economic activity and employment. And we are doing the cross-country version of that, and we are showing that actually monetary policy, okay, you know, can offset that to some extent. Yeah. Sorry? They did that much more. They did a much more localized level. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. Yes. While, while yeah. you will not be subject to the issues that we have funds in the Eurozone are all uh, behaving in a similar way because of other policies that they coordinate. Uh, I see. Yeah, that would be nice to do. Uh, but I, I would think because they find things affect at the county level, I would be very surprised if you don't see it at the state level when you aggregate up to it. So, but anyways, but that would be a, a nice thing to do, yes. But, well, so if you look at the sort of the last panel here, we view this as sort of showing some, remember our first result was that unless offset by monetary policy, you're gonna have big declines in economic activity and this is what that shows, investment consumption output goes down. Now the last panel shows there is some spillover or feedback effects or that's how we want to interpret it, right? This is a price to house, the house price shock slows down economic activity. In our model, it lowers earnings of firms and 
This is are the earnings of stocks. Uh, and as you see in the data too, earnings go down. And as you see, stock prices uh, go down as well, although the standard errors here are large because stocks are, are very noisy. Okay, so you do see some spillover effects from house prices to, to stock prices due to constrained monetary policy. So, uh, you know, that supports the feedback effects. Uh, so uh, let me go back to theory now. So, okay, so, uh, yeah. Um, which is, you know, you have a collateral and then, you know, if the price of houses goes down, I can demand less. Instead, yours is a supply. If uh, I perceive risk, you know, I am a household, I have my savings, but I'm not willing to buy, you know, financial houses. Yeah, you don't want to buy houses because now you start value houses less, exactly. That's the so, but the fact that one acts on the supply and the other on the demand might give you, not different empirical implications. Of um, course, it, you, you can have financial constraints on intermediaries who are yes. suppliers, you know, but there are some cases, like take a look at house prices in the household sector, you know, maybe there are some things we can explore. Definitely there are things that we could do, and I'd be happy to talk more about that. But let me move on because I have limited time and I want to show the results on macroprudential policy as well. So, so, okay, so we introduce heterogeneous beliefs now into the dynamic setting, and optimists are optimistic in the way you think. In the, when there is a high-risk state, they think it's not going to last very long. They think recovery is around the corner. And when, there is a, when you're in the low-risk state, they think you're not going to switch into the high-risk state. Okay, it's unlikely. And so we view this as capturing as various sources of heterogeneous valuations. We are not necessarily tied into the disagreements view, although we think that disagreements have been relevant, for instance, in the housing bubble in, around the world in, in, the rec in recent years. Uh, so in this version of the model, effective optimism, um, there, there is this no sort of variable called effective optimism, which is a wealth-weighted average of the beliefs of the, the two agents. And that turns out to be the key thing that determines asset prices and so on. You can show that, in fact, there's going to be now a price function. Now, it's not just a number. The price in the high-risk state will be a function of optimist wealth share, and it's going to be an increasing function, right? When there's more optimist, the prices are going to be higher, and economic activity and output uh, is going to be higher in the high-risk state. Okay, so, okay, so, but here's the interesting thing: optimist wealth share is not constant, right? Because these guys are also have different beliefs; they're speculating. So, in particular, something very intuitive happens when you're in the low-risk state. Optimists are gambling that the low-risk state will continue. So they buy they, in this version of in our model, they sell actually insurance to the other guys and collect the premiums and their wealth share goes up if the good state continues, but there's a transition to the bad state, their wealth share collapses, right? Sorry, so, so just remember, here optimists and pessimists are equally wrong, but let's say- Well, it, it doesn't matter who is right, let me put it, because we're gonna do welfare by respecting people's own beliefs, but you could think about who is right. Who is right would determine objectively what happens to the wealth share in the very, very long run. But eventually will get wiped out. Yeah, but that, you say, so, but that, that eventually takes a really long time if you sort of quantify it. So, you know, it's not a, it's true that whoever is closer to the truth survives here, but, you know, that those are, you know, relevant only very long horizons, so it's not, not our focus. Okay, so, so here, uh, good times vindicate optimists and increase their wealth, but then bad times collapse optimist wealth, and if the bad times continue, actually optimist wealth keeps going down, because in the bad states, they are now, Betting on the recovery, they are buying call options, and if it's not realized, you know, their wealth share goes down. So good times indicate optimists, they grow. Bad times indicate pessimists, their wealth share grows. So the economy becomes effectively extrapolative, even though no one is extrapolating. Right? Extrapolation comes through speculation between these uh, agents with different valuations. And the point is that this extrapolation is bad for macro, right? Because the collapse in optimist wealth here will make the recession worse and we'll create an externality on all the agents, including optimists themselves, but because they take prices as given, they don't internalize that. So they take too much risk in good times from an aggregate uh, point of view, right? So that's why, in fact, so, so, okay, this is a simulation of the model uh, that illustrates that recessions become much worse when you have belief disagreements. So what we do here, so we, uh, so we simulate the model for 50 years, so the, the top panel shows the risk shock, so there's an increase in the uh, and the risk, risk uh, and then there's a, a decline and so on, right? So 
And uh, this shows the interest rate, and the red is the first best, right? In the first best, monetary policy reduces the interest rate to offset the risk shocks, and nothing happens to asset prices or growth or output. But in our model, monetary policy is constrained. So the green is what happens when you have common beliefs. You see monetary policy is constrained, so we have low prices uh, and a recession. And blue is what happens when you add belief dispersion around that, keeping the average belief fixed, OK? So you see the dispersion alone generates additional damage. Because in these good times, optimists speculate, and their wealth share declines a lot, and that makes the recessions worse once you go into the, you don't have, just like when you need house prices collapse is when you need the housing optimists to support house prices, but they have bet, bet too much in good times, and that's why their wealth share collapses. And you know, the question you. Very similar results. That's why I try to be more general. We say like optimists and so high uh, heterogeneous valuations because we think results, in fact, would be very similar if optimists were the more risk tolerant guys and pessimists were the more risk averse guys. It's just that version of the model is uh, more complicated. So uh, belief disagreements turn out to be easier. But when we do welfare, actually, so we also have a formal welfare analysis and we show that, in fact, macro prudential policy can generate a Pareto improvement. And when we do this welfare analysis of so Pareto improvement in the sense that we respect people's beliefs, right? So, and the policy that we have is basically we have the following type of policy. We, uh, we assume the planner through some instruments can make optimists act as if they are less optimistic, okay? I'm gonna make them act as if they are more pessimistic, but I'm gonna evaluate their welfare with their own beliefs. So they're not gonna like this. You know, leaving aside the aggregate demand externalities, they're not gonna like this. And what we find is that, in fact, if you look at the first best value function, this policy will always reduce the first best value function because there's no other distortion in the first best. So if you reduce speculation, you can only make things worse. But in our model, the value function is going to go up. And it's going to go up precisely because this thing, what we call the gap value function, is going to go up thanks to macro prudential policy. What is the gap value? Is the gap value is how much you're underperforming relative to the first best because of these demand recessions, right? What the macro prudential policy is doing is preserving optimist wealth during demand recessions and keeping you closer to the first best and keeping you closer to capacity, and that increases uh, the social uh, welfare and it generates a Pareto uh, improvement. And, and one thing I should note, so this uh, refers to a macro prudential policy in the low risk state, like in, the, in boom times, you wanna you do this, okay? So you can also think about doing macro prudential policy during the recession, because there is also speculation in the recession, and there is some of the effects are there as well. But if you do it during the recession, you generate another effect, which is not very good. By restricting optimists, you are creating an immediate decline in asset prices, and you don't have the monetary policy to offset that, okay? So what happens when you do macro prudential policy in the good state is that uh, macro prudential policy is restricting optimists, and monetary policy is lowering the interest rate to optim offset the price decline that results from that. So you want to do, for that reason, you want to do macro prudential policy more in good times and less so in bad times. Okay, so we naturally get procyclical uh, macro prudential policy. Essentially, we want to bait out the optimists. No? Yeah. So if you allow for, yeah, so we, we we focus on a very restricted set of instruments. If you so if you, if you, you definitely want to bail out the high valuation in good times guys. You want the optimists to come down, and in bad times you want them to. Yeah. You want to give the wealth and have them not exactly. Have so if you can do these transfers, you want to. In fact, that's similar to the bailouts that you've seen. If you view, interpret the banks or the financial institutions as the high valuation agents uh, in your economy. Okay. So well, let me stop here. Let me just leave you with this figure, uh, which summarizes the mechanism. So uh, I showed it at the end because if I showed it in the beginning, it's completely incomprehensible. But now it should be comprehensible. We have a high risk premium that lowers asset prices, and that lowers aggregate demand, and that further feeds back into asset prices and and these effects are stronger when there are belief disagreements because speculation reshuffles the wealth in exactly the way you don't want it to be reshuffled. Okay, so you know, let me stop here. Uh, Any questions? Question. Yes. That's actually that's a great question. So if you sort of like think about like I mean in our model there's complete markets, so they're really trading with richer securities in practice with incomplete markets, these guys would probably, optimists would take risk via leverage. And if you put a leverage restriction without really knowing who's the optimist, you would uh, pick the right guys uh, naturally. So you could, in fact, we, have, we don't do that, but my guess is that you, know, you can do it without a lot of informational burdens on you know, the central plan. You just need to put uh, risk restrictions and they will end up naturally binding for the high valuation. But what you need is the high valuation guys in good times to be the same as the high valuation guys in the bad times, right? 
for our mechanism, we need that persistence. Do I need to know the, the right transition probability? No. Well, for the optimal policy, yes, but uh, for I mean, so our our main result is that at the margin, there's all, you know you always want to do some of that. So for a small policies, you don't need, but for opt to find the exact optimal, you would need to. Yeah. Yes. One thing you know, I'm obsessed. I continue to be obsessed. <laughs> you know, but maybe one thing would be to replace, you know, house price changes with stock price changes. Mm -hmm. You know, changes in stock market. Yes. Uh, value because that's less intermediated in terms of you know, it's yeah. not used for lateral trade because it's hard to borrow, you know, through so margin <laughs> to buy stock. So in that respect. So that's a great question. In fact, of course, we have tried that, right? So there's a dog that didn't work. There's a reason why I'm not showing the stock prices. Uh, because it turns out that stock prices are, I can tell you what happens when you put stock prices into those regressions. So, so they're riskier, first of all. So the things are, are not as, even in our model, stock prices move for demand and supply reasons. There's a sigma, and it's difficult to isolate the demand in the, in the, in the stock price. But more importantly, they also endogenously move because of monetary policy. What we find is that, in fact, a decline in the stock prices can be followed by an increase in the interest rate, not because they cause the interest, in the, but they predict the increase in the interest rate. Stock prices predict monetary policy. So you find, want to find a variation in stock prices sort of to isolate the demand shocks that are not confounded by supply shocks or monetary policy changes. And we are working on it, so stay tuned. So hopefully we'll have some result along those lines as well. But yes. I just have a quick comment about this, uh, you know, independence of monetary policy. So I completely see where you're coming from, and I buy the evidence, but it's also true that, for instance, when you devalue, if you have the freedom, for instance, to devalue, to think of the open economy, mm -hmm. on the one hand, you can stimulate the economy with maybe foreign demand. On the other hand, it's a huge workshop many times mm -hmm. to domestic agents. Yes, so, it's true. Uh, it's true. You know, and this takes you back to this literature on contractionary yeah. devaluations, you know, which is more based on financial yeah. fictions. Yeah. So you know, it's a little bit like the debate yeah. now if yeah. you know should you leave the euro well maybe you mm -hmm. would get more freedom to devalue accommodate aggregate demand on the other hand it would wipe out a lot of wealth potentially and it's not obvious how to well you could have if you have financial frictions and if devaluations are associated there is like a currency mismatch on the balance sheet of yes. key agents and it could be an issue yes absolutely so um but I mean, p part of the interest rate effect in Spain would be the local demand so even without the devaluation but of course that would be potential damage. I mean, I'm from Turkey, I and mean, that's a big concern in Turkey now. If like, there's a big devaluation, then that could wipe out uh, banks or firms that borrowed in dollars. So yeah, these are concerns which are not in our model. So it will be relevant if you put financial frictions, yes. So the problem here is that investment interest rates don't explain much. So one natural instrument, and forget about macro proof, is tax haven. One thing also is tax haven. Yeah, so if you're, well, yeah, well, uh, yeah, you, if you can, if you can lower the interest rate, if you think zero lower bond is the problem and lower the interest rate via fiscal instruments, yes, but in practice for the, during the time frame that these things matter, it turns out to be harder to change those policies, so, but what we have found is like, uh, well, you can set the macro policy once and then, you know, but you could, I think we should think about those things going forward, but what we found in the recent episode is that ZLB, turned out to be arguably binding. So the interest rate did fall to zero. And you know, we had some fiscal policy, but not enough to offset uh, any damage. Yeah. Well, in Japan, they tried to do it. You know, didn't they have like a temporary subsidy yeah. to consumption, effectively yeah. trying to shift the US rate? Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a big literature now on the zero lower bond, thinking about these issues, et cetera. But the, my takeaway was that it's you know, not easy to fully offset the zero lower bond practical settings, those policies.